Now, I want to highlight a couple of things here. The free market argument for minimum wages or unionization is that it's actually going to cause more harm than good. It's actually going to be a, have a negative effect. And yet, when you go out and even talk to general public or you talk to economists even, we're going to find that a lot of people support the policies of minimum wages. Raising the minimum wage today is very popular in America. And also, most people will sympathize with unions and say, you know, unions are a good thing. It's actually helping people and we need to have, you know, more unionization rather than less. So I want to talk a little bit about the argument for the other side. Why do people seem to support a policy that our simple analysis suggests is likely to cause more harm than good? Okay, here's a couple of arguments. Not one. Most people, non-economists, don't know the economic argument. Okay, so they're just unfamiliar with the argument that I just made to you about why the costs are greater than the benefits of unionization and of minimum wages. Okay, second, the simple argument that they hear is very convincing. You know, we want to help poor or lower income individuals. We want to get their wages to a living wage. We want to make sure that they're not exploited, that they have good working conditions and all of that. And that all sounds good. So to be compassionate for the lower income households, especially, it seems to make sense to support minimum wages and, and unionization. Now, I, I will highlight that one reason for support of policies comes from members in labor unions. And when the, a few years ago they were talking about, you know, a big push to try to increase the federal minimum wage, I learned that there's a lot of labor union contracts that are currently out there that tie their wages to the minimum wage. So if minimum wages rise, current labor contracts are written in such a way that actually that's going to raise the wages of lots of non-minimum wage union workers because of the way in which the contracts have been written in the past. And that inspires a lot of support today for increases in minimum wages so that those who are not making minimum wages in unions actually get paid more. And that actually fuels some of the lobbying support for these particular policies that are out there. Now, there's another reason that I want to highlight about minimum wages. Economists have been analyzing the effects of minimum wages for the last 50 or 100 years, probably. And they've been gathering empirical evidence when minimum wages have been increased in different jurisdictions, different countries, and so forth. And in the 1990s, there was a, an influential study that was done by Princeton economists Card and Kruger. And they did a study in New Jersey where New Jersey raised the minimum wage, but Pennsylvania right next door to it did not. And they looked at the differences in employment and the effects in the market in New Jersey versus Pennsylvania. And this is, this is what's often referred to as a natural experiment, where you've got kind of a control group, and you've got a, a group that's been influenced by the policy, and then you, they're very similar in all of their characteristics, and then you compare the outcomes between the two to see what effect the intervention actually had. And what they found is that the minimum wage in New Jersey had only a very small effect upon employment, and in fact, seemed to actually increase employment a little bit. That instead of causing a uh, increase in unemployment in the area, it actually increased employment in minimum wage jobs instead. That set off an explosion of studies that tried to duplicate that result and to try to understand how and why it could be that raising minimum wages could actually increase employment, because that seems to contradict our standard perfectly competitive model. Now, there's been lots of studies that have been going on for the last 20 or 30 years now looking at this. And I will point out that the empirical evidence, from what I've seen, it, it swings both ways. It continues to show in some regards that employment is reduced and that unemployment is created as a result of minimum wage increases. And there's other studies that tend to support the Card and Kruger result here that maybe those minimum wage increases are not so damaging as previously suggested. So empirically, there has been this mixed evidence, and that has lent a lot of support on the part of economists who are, are arguing today that, that maybe minimum wages are a good thing and that maybe we should, we should promote them and support that policy because of some of the empirical evidence that's out there. 
Okay, but I want to I want to give you one other argument here, and this is the argument that really, if you're going to support a higher minimum wage, there is an argument for why minimum wages can actually work to the betterment of the market, and that the market can actually become better off. One possibility is that the labor market is not perfectly competitive. There's not lots of sellers of of work, and there's not lots of buyers of work. But there actually is more that firms actually have what we might call monopsony power in the labor market. Monopsony, remember, I mentioned this in passing before, is what happens when you have a single buyer or a single firm buying workers in the labor market. And a monopsonist can actually take advantage of its position in the market by cutting the demand for the product that it's buying and, and lowering the price that it gets for it. That's how a monopsony will behave. Well, what I'm going to do is to highlight in a minute what happens when there's a monopsony in the labor market. And, and we're going to see that that can actually generate a positive outcome for a minimum wage. Now, there's two arguments, though, about monopsony. The argument, one, is that monopsony is very unlikely in the unskilled labor market because there's so many job opportunities. So, you know, you go to a McDonald's and you work at a low minimum wage. You don't like your job you think your working conditions are unsafe, you can leave your McDonald's job and get a job at another fast food place. You can get a minimum wage job at Walmart. You can get a minimum wage job in re There's lots and lots of minimum wage jobs that you can compete with, look for jobs. There's not just one buyer. So the market itself doesn't look very monopsonistic at all. However, more and more, and this is amongst economists who are sympathetic to the minimum wage argument, and also inspired by the empirical evidence supporting the positive effects of minimum wages, they've been actually looking more deeply and suggesting that maybe there's more monopsony power out there than we would think. They argue, for example, that even in many minimum wage jobs, there are costs of switching to other jobs, that even minimum wage workers are sometimes forced to, comp to sign non-compete clauses, which prevent them from moving to another competitor firm if they quit their job or leave a particular employment for a period of time. There's firms that enter into what are called no poaching agreements, where they agree not to try to attract workers that are working in similarly positioned um, jobs elsewhere in the industry. And that the sum total of all of these effects might be to have and force some monopsony power on the part of firms. Again, I would argue the case is not closed yet. We have a lot more to learn, and we don't know exactly what the right answer is here.